Hi everyone. Welcome to the Live Longer World podcast where I have conversations with scientists, entrepreneurs and other advocates that are transforming the field of longevity science. I am your host Astha Jain. Besides this podcast, I also have other content on longevity science. So if you wish to sign up for my longevity newsletter, if you want to be notified for upcoming podcast releases, if you want to support my work and follow me on social media, you will find all these resources on my website which is livelongerworld.com. My guest today is Dr. Morgan Levine. If you are familiar with the space of aging and longevity, I am sure you are familiar with Morgan's work around epigenetic clocks. Dr. Levine is an assistant professor of pathology and epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine. She also runs the Lab for Aging in Living Systems at Yale. And her lab focuses on epigenetic clocks, epigenetic reprogramming, cellular aging trajectories, and also in trying to understand some of the causes of Alzheimer's disease. I can't even begin to tell you how much I learned in this conversation and how excited I was in talking to Dr. Morgan. We discussed her work around developing a new epigenetic clock, which is the system's age clock and is very cool. We also spoke about some of the different features of epigenetic clocks, interventions being tested by these clocks, what we know so far about reversing your biological age, some of the limitations of clocks, why she is so excited about epigenetic reprogramming, and some of her work around Alzheimer's disease. It was a comprehensive conversation and I think you will learn a lot. I know most people are interested in knowing their biological age and epigenetic clocks are one way to test them. So I'm sure you will find this conversation fascinating and walk away understanding them much better. Okay, let's dive in and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Morgan Levine. Hi Morgan and welcome to the Live Longer World show. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely, I'm excited to be here. I am very excited for this conversation. I'm uh, extremely interested in learning about epigenetic clocks and I think you're one of the best people to be talking to for that. We can get started with maybe for those who aren't too familiar with longevity in the aging space, if you can talk a bit about what biological age means and some of the differences between chronological and biological age. Yeah, exactly. So um, everyone, I think, knows what chronological age is, right? It's your, the age on your driver's license is essentially how long you've been alive. You can measure it in, in days, years, um, months. But probably the more important thing that people don't often think about is what we call your biological age, which is really the kind of state of your aging. So we think of, you know, over your life course, you'll have biological or molecular changes um, to your system. And these are actually why we tend to see an increased risk of things like uh, disease incidence, so things like cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, um, or an increased risk of death as a function of, usually we associate this with your chronological age, but really what's happening is that that's actually associated with this biological aging process that's occurring. Um, but the important thing is that bi the biological aging process doesn't occur at exactly the same rate for everybody. So for some people, it'll occur slower. For some people, it'll occur faster. And so we can actually calculate what we call your biological age, which puts you kind of in reference to the population. So, you know, you may be 50 years old chronologically, but we could say, your biological profile is actually more reflective of someone who is, let's say 40 years old on average or six years old on average. And because that's actually capturing the changes that matter for health, it ends up being a better predictor of kind of your future health risks and actually a more important number to know than your chronological age. Absolutely, I think that's such a simple and great way to explain it. Um, and one of the ways you capture this biological age is using epigenetic clocks, which you work on. Um, so I guess before we start diving into the clocks, uh, out of curiosity, how did you get interested in this field, this area is more specifically of epigenetic clocks? Um, so I actually, uh, so I've been interested in aging for a very long time and actually did my PhD in 
gerontology. So my focus during my PhD was particularly on aging. And actually during that time, you know, I got very frustrated. There was always a lot of talk of, can we slow aging? Can we reverse aging? And there's a lot of debate on the, in the field of what is aging. So I, I kind of set about thinking, well, can we just measure aging? Can we just start with that? Because we're never gonna know if we actually intervened. If you can't measure what you're trying to actually change. Um, so during my PhD, I actually worked on kind of using clinical chemistry measures to develop biological age uh, changes so, or biological age estimates. So I think it was 2012, possibly 2013, I actually published a paper, which I got to do on my own as a PhD student, which is pretty exciting, right? So it's a single author paper where I made this biological age measure and showed it's more predictive of mortality than chronological age. And then maybe a year after that, uh, the original was called Horvath Clock paper came out, which was not necessarily the first epigenetic clock, but definitely the most prolific um, epigenetic clock. And then, you know, once I saw that, I thought, oh, rather than even using these clinical measures, one can do this even better using epigenetic measures. So at that point, I ended up doing uh, my postdoc with Steve and kind of my work on epigenetic clocks evolved from there. That's good. And we'll definitely touch a bit on the history of uh, epigenetic clocks and first generation, second generation clocks. Uh, but maybe we can talk a bit about just DNA methylation, because at least the clocks you work with, they primarily work with DNA methylation data. Um, I guess if you can explain just what it is and uh, changes that it occurs that occur with age, and also how it's even connected to these clocks. Yeah, so um, the clocks are based on measures of DNA methylation. So we usually will measure this at tens of thousands to often millions of different locations across the genome. And, and what I mean by measure DNA methylation is that um, DNA methylation is what we call an epigenetic modification. So it's not changing the sequence in your DNA. So it's not changing whether you have A, C, G, or T, but there are these locations throughout the genome called CPG sites where you basically have a C that's right before a G if you read you know, from five prime to three prime along a strand. And these CPG sites can have a chemical modification where they have an addition of a methyl group, which in that case we call it methylated. So these are methylated CPGs. Um, and this is important because also depending on where this is in the genome, it can change kind of the conformation of the chromatin. So it can, we usually think of more methylation as closed chromatin. So that is usually associated with repression of, of that section of the genome. Whereas if you um, demethylate something, it, it has a more open kind of chromatin which may, means that it is more active. So, um, so what, what we'll usually do is we take what, what's considered a bulk sample. So we have a sample, whether it's blood, saliva, some other tissue where you have thousands or millions of cells in there. And we estimate DNA methylation, which again is usually binary, right? It's methylated at that site or it's not. But in the, the bulk, we actually get kind of a proportion. How, what proportion of the cells in that sample are methylated at each site. And some sites tend to be what we call very hypomethylated. So very rare do you have a cell with methylation at that site. Some are very hypermethylated. So almost all the cells are methylated. And then there's a few in the middle, but most tend to be towards the extremes. But what we see with age is that you get changes. So the ones typically that were hypomethylated become get gain methylation with age. And the ones that were hypermethylated lose methylation with age. Um, although sometimes you have ones going e even more to the extremes. I see, okay. And that you've noticed is um, a good signal to capture what your biological age is. Yeah, so, so because so much of, so many of the CPGs change. So I think we've estimated that, you know, when you measure almost a million CPGs, about 10% show very significant changes in their methylation levels with age. Um, you can actually combine that information to get a good estimate of someone's age. So if I know, you know, usually a 20-year-old has 10% methylation in this CPG, but you have 40%, I can kind of combine all of those 
numbers and actually get a pretty good, because of the law of large numbers, estimate of someone's age based on that. I see, okay, interesting. Uh, do we have any sense of why these, there, there are these changes in methylation as we age? Uh, no, so that's actually what my lab has become more. In. So, you know, in the past, I did a lot of work on developing these clocks. Now I've kind of taken a step back and said, I wanna understand number one, what drives these, what, what we're even picking up, why these work so well across different tissues. And it, they just seem to be such a universal phenomenon. But I would say as of right now, we don't know what is driving. Some people argue it's just entropy, right? So if you have things on the extremes, they'll just randomly go in the other direction. And so you kind of get, but it's, it's too systematic, I think, for it to actually be entropy. Um, even though you might say there's a probability that this one will be more effective than that one, I think it, it doesn't seem random enough to me to actually just be this kind of noisy stochastic change. I see, interesting. So you have noticed, I guess, very systematic or maybe patterns that you can probably estimate in advance and predict it's not, it doesn't seem to be random in most individuals. Yeah, no, it, I, it's definitely this, you know, you can say this CPG changes, we, we can kind of almost predict the percent of methylation changes a function of every year of, of hmm. time. So it, it's too systematic, I think, to be entropy. I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, I'm, I'm curious to hear what your, your lab is working on. I know it, internally you've been working on a new clock. I think you've been calling it systems age clock. I'm not sure publicly you have a different name for it yet. Uh, that, that's what it is now, but we're definitely thinking of different names, so yeah. Yeah, so uh, maybe why don't you tell us a bit about what, what is the system age clock and how it even came to be, what's the, the history behind it? Yeah, so the system age clock really came about um, because we had this one question of if I have two people with the exact same chronological age and the exact same predicted epigenetic age, are they really the same biologically? Um, and we actually were thinking, you know, there actually could be multiple ways people get to a specific epigenetic age, right? You might be accelerating in a certain domain, whereas another person could be accelerated in a different domain, but you, because it's all averaged together, end up to, in the same place. Um, and this is really because we know not only do people differ in how fast they're aging, but they also differ in kind of how they're aging. So. Um, this is really well characterized in Mike Snyder's paper where he used not, he, they didn't use epigenetics or methylation in that paper, but they use proteomics and RNA seq and all these other omics based to categorize people into what they call ageotypes and showed, you know, some people have accelerated kidney and liver aging, but slower immune aging. So we kind of went back and thought, well, maybe we can do this using methylation. So what we did for the systems clock is to first take normal clinical measures that people use to assess different organ functions. So you have uh, things like um, ALT or something for a liver, or you know you have different immune markers for kind of immune health, and group them according to a system. So we ended up with I believe it's nine systems: so liver, kidney, heart immune, we, we separated immune and, and cytokine, like inflammation, um, blood, brain, hormone, and I might be forgetting one, but, um, and we basically made measure, like clinical measures to estimate kind of aging or, or processes in each of those, and then trained uh, epigenetic clocks of each one. So then you end up with eight separate epigenetic clocks or nine separate epigenetic clocks that are specific to different systems, we can combine them into a whole clock to get kind of your holistic aging, which so far it seems like this clock is more predictive of morbidity and mortality than any of the existing epigenetic clocks. But what we think is more exciting is we can actually use this to understand different profiles of people. So group people according to aging faster versus slower in certain systems or domains and what is, you know, what are the things that contribute to fast aging in one of these domains versus another? What does it mean in terms of risk of specific diseases? So if I'm 
aging faster in heart, but slower in, let's say, brain uh, system, does that mean I'm going to be much more at risk of cardiovascular disease, but less of Alzheimer's? And I think from the original clocks, you weren't able to get that kind of fine grain information. That's super cool. I was going to ask you some questions on uh, disease specific clocks as well, but I guess you've explained it a bit. So, so now it's like you're saying I can use this clock and basically get tissue or organ specific ages for the nine systems you've developed and then also get a meta, meta age uh, mm -hmm. saying what my biological or chronological age is. And now yeah. when I have, say, a system specific clock, you can intervene more directly, for example, if my immune system is aging much faster than my liver or kidney, I can go ahead and try to fix some of the damage in my immune system more specifically. Yeah, we, so we haven't you know, gotten to the point where we can say what interventions are going to be more advantageous depending on your profile, but we think that's the next step, right? So certain profiles might do better from, you know, whether it's a behavioral change or a specific intervention might actually work better in them. This can also change inclusion criteria for people who are developing um, pharmacological or other interventions. They might want people who have specific aging profiles because they think their intervention will be better targeted to them. But yeah, that's the ultimate goal will be to use this to actually figure out more on a personal level what's what's the better way to intervene in the aging process. And more from, I guess, an average or patterns perspective, have you noticed anything about certain systems aging faster than others? Um, yeah, so we find, we actually find strong correlations between certain systems. So, so again, all the systems are at least weakly correlated with each other, because as you think about, you know, a, a human is a complex system and there's crosstalk and you're, the, the systems aren't aging in isolation, but we definitely find stronger connections between a few of them. So I think if I remember correctly, heart and kidney are very closely aligned. Um, so people who tend to be accelerated in heart are also tend to be accelerated in kidney. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think there was one other, but I'm not, I'm not remembering, but that was the strongest one. Um, I think it was blood and brain were the other. And blood in this case was, things like red blood cell and platelet measures. So separate from the immune one. I see, okay. And and do some of these systems start failing earlier than, than others? For example, is it sort of a pattern where my liver starts degenerating when I'm in my forties, but my kidneys survive so my sixties or something like that? Yeah, so the way they're constructed because they're all relative to the general population, they all show similar Trend, but I think on a person by person basis, that's definitely going to be the case where for, you know, ultimately everyone, all your systems are going to age, but some of them might start failing first. And actually it will be interesting. We haven't looked at this yet, whether there is some cascading events that occur, right? As one happens, is it starting to then accelerate it in other ones? And I think this will be really useful once we have longitudinal data. So right now, um, we aren't following the same people over time, per se. We have kind of people at different ages. But once you can actually start doing that, I think that will be really informative to understand kind of what path a person might be going down and, and almost predict where they might be based on kind of where they are now and were previously. Right, right, exactly. And then, as you said, you can also predict chances of, I guess, based on their genetics plus epigenetics, uh, chances of getting certain specific diseases maybe faster than others or at risk for certain diseases more so. Yep. Yeah. yeah exactly. So jumping into some of the features of uh, these clocks, and maybe you can talk to some of the past ones as well, or uh, the systems age clock, um, how reliable are they in their data? Are they consistent if I'm taking my test today versus a one month later. And also, I guess, because um, I was reading this somewhere, timing of day when I take it, like if I'm taking it in the morning versus taking it at night, for example. So I will tell you that the traditional clocks are highly unreliable. So we actually have a paper coming out on this exact topic where we have looked across six different clocks and we've said, let's just take the exact same blood sample and do, so we have technical replicates. It's not even one day and then another day. It's the same blood oh. sample asking, do we get the same answer? And unfortunately, no. So a lot of the original clocks, whether it's 
you know, the original pan tissue Horvath clock, whether it's Fino age, um, which I helped develop, gives you deviations sometimes up to nine years between. So it might say one of your, you know, half your sample might say your, let's say 30 and another half might say that you're, you know, 21. And this is a huge issue. So it's not, it hasn't been a big problem in these epidemiological studies of clocks because you have so many people, you know, some people are over predicted randomly, some people under a kind of is a wash. But when we start talking about using these either on an individual and of one level to track our own aging or use this um, in clinical trials, this becomes a big problem. So actually we developed a method that can remove this technical noise and actually get all the clocks to be um, predict almost everyone exactly the same age for both replicates. But nobody, I, I don't think, is predicted more than one or two years different, you know, for their two replicates. Um, and we've shown that this will hugely reduce the number of samples you need for a clinical trial because. If you imagine your, your intervention is going to slow aging by three years, if you have noise, then you would need tons of people to find that. But the, because this cleans it up, we've hugely reduced uh, the sample size issue and also um, just made this a lot more reliable for people who want to take this kind of as a personal kind of health tracking thing. Um, your second question, when it comes to time of day, uh, that's actually something we're actively exploring. Um, so I would say that before with the traditional clocks, because they were so noisy, there would be no, there's, there's so much technical um, noise that it's hard to identify the biological kind of variants because um, it's just obscured. So now that we actually have these, um, my postdoc is actually converting to a faculty position. This is really what he's focused on is, are, you know, what is this short time period changes? Does, do we need to tell clinical trials or individuals that they need to test only at a certain time of day? Does it follow some circadian fluctuation? Um, so the answer is I don't know yet, but hopefully our guess is there's probably some circadian input, but, but we don't know for sure yet and to what extent that is. Interesting. Well, it's being worked on, so I'm curious to know what, when it comes out. Um, what about type of sample? Like if I'm giving a saliva sample versus blood sample, is that, is that something you're testing as well? Yeah, so um, luckily blood and saliva are actually very correlated with each other. Um, that, that is because the majority of the cells in your saliva are actually white blood cells. Um, and what we pick up in blood is just the white blood cells. Granted, there are other cells in your saliva, like epithelial cells that will change it a little bit. Um, but we have been able to produce very similar measure. So basically we've been able to produce saliva based versions of the blood clocks that are highly, when you have the same person, you have their blood and their saliva, they're highly correlated and you can get a really good predictor from saliva what someone's blood epigenetic age would be. Um, other tissues, not so much. So this is part of the problem in the field. Um, even though these epigen clocks work really beautifully in brain, your blood epigenetic age is not correlated with your epigenetic age if I were to take a sample from your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is unfortunate because if we want to do anything about things like tracking Alzheimer's disease or dementia risk, you can't necessarily go around and access brain tissue from individuals um, or do biopsies. So we have to somehow build proxies for what we think is happening on the epigenetic level or, or in terms of other kind of biochemical changes in, in brain. I see. So is brain the one black box right now? So I guess I missed it. It's not part of the nine systems then? In your system so it is part of the nine systems. So we aren't, so yeah, uh, to go back to the systems clock, we aren't measuring epigenetic age in different tissues, but we're, we're, so we actually haven't tested whether the epigenetic brain system is associated with your brain methylation, because right now we don't have good paired, we would need samples that are blood methylation and brain methylation from the same people to do that. 
we can show that this brain measure, this brain system measure we've created is associated with cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. So we think and hope that it's associated with epigenetic changes in the brain. But prior clocks were very weakly associated, I'll say. I see. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So it's like, it, there are almost, I guess, two different ways of um, measuring brain aging. Then one is what you're doing with the system age clock, and then you want to test it against um, in, like the epigenetic changes in the brain itself using a different measure then. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's kind of different ways that we can talk about this. So one is I'm directly measuring the epigenetic changes in a given tissue. So if I were to directly measure it in the brain, um, mm -hmm. But then what the systems clock does is it, it's measuring the changes in blood, but it's correlating it with kind of biochemical, um, or, or it's correlating with proteins that we find in serum and plasma that we know are associated with brain aging and dementia risk. Um, so we're actually not accessing anything from the brain directly um, to get the brain measure for the systems clock, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. What about other organs though? Cause it, other tissues or systems liver, for example, it seems like you are also, you're testing the aid specifically for that organ or tissue. So, no, not, so for the systems clock, none of them are measured directly in the organ that we're saying the system is associated. They're all measured in blood or saliva, um, but they're just trained on physiological markers associated with that system. So there's kind of like a whole liver panel that if you went to your primary care doctor and had a assessment. So we use that information rather than anything about the liver tissue itself. I see, okay, okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, um, I'm curious, um, do the, does the age um, correlate with health biomarkers as well for the systems age class, such as, I don't know, maybe C-reactive protein for inflammation. And the reason I ask this is because um, I heard Steve Horvath uh, talking about the Hispanic mo mortality paradox, uh, especially, I guess, with the Horvath clock itself, where he noticed that even though Hispanics, um, they have poor health biomarkers, when you look at their age on the epigenetic clock, the, maybe the Horvath clock, they seem to be aging slower than most of the population. Um, so yeah, I, I guess with the systems age clock, have you noticed something, any correlation with health biomarkers? Yeah, so, so the systems clock is actually trained because it's trained directly on the health biomarkers. Um, it actually passes them out. So CRP is one of many biomarkers included in the inflammation component. So in the inflammation component, it's things like CRP. We actually have a whole um, uh, inflammatory cytokine panel that that information gets incorporated. We haven't with the systems clock looked at kind of things so I, I know the Hispanic Paradox paper, um, we haven't looked at that with this clock to see if individuals of Hispanic um, ancestry or origin are younger on one of these systems or another. Um, but we do have that data and across a few different racial ethnic groups. And yeah, it would be interesting to see whether there's certain groups that are more prone or less prone to aging faster or slower in different systems. Um, and if this can explain any of these things, I will say with the Hispanic paradox, there are a few non-biological explanations for why, for why it may occur. So people talk about, I think um, one of them is like the salmon phenomenon that, uh, that unhealthy individuals go back to their home country um, mm -hmm. or that there's a selection for who actually is able to emigrate and then I do know that they see it somewhat attenuate um, the longer generations have been here um, but yeah I think it's a really interesting phenomenon that it would I, I do think it would be cool if we can verify that the epigen clocks are actually picking up this paradox yeah, no, absolutely. But, but but I agree with you. I'm sure there are so many uh, social phenomena going on there as well. Um, so what about COVID? Have you been able to, have you tested with COVID uh, at all, whether it's predictive of um, your your yeah ch chance of getting COVID or, se severe, or how severe it would be? Yeah, so we haven't um, predicted it in terms of um, getting COVID, but what we have, we have done kind of two different studies. One of them's published, one of them's not. So the published one 
um, we use just a clinical biomarker. So this is actually um, a measure called phenotypic age, which was the measure that one of my previous blocks, DNA and phenoage was trained on. And for that one, we actually have shown that when we measure people's phenotypic age 10 years prior to COVID even happening, so back in like 2010, differences were actually associated with uh, severity of COVID in 2020. Um, so this is using the UK Biobank uh, data. So we, we did show there that even among people who spent chronological age, those who had faster of this phenotypic age actually experienced worse um, symptoms from COVID if, if they got infected. Hmm. Um, we have not done that with methylation because the data doesn't exist. So we don't have a good data resource where we have methylation measured across lots of people prior to the pandemic. And then we have information about who got COVID and what their symptoms were. Um, we do have one uh, data set, which again, this one's not published yet, where we can just look at methylation af after people got COVID. So we can say among people who were inpatient or outpatient, do the people who have severe COVID look more severe? And we looked at these system um, uh, clocks. And what we can find is that it is accelerated as a function of severity of symptoms for COVID and particularly in specific systems like the inflammation kind of cytokine one, which is very much what you would expect. So COVID causes this cytokine storm, which is associated with kind of symptoms and we can pick that up with the methylation data. I see, is there any data on, I guess, by how much the clock gets accelerated after you get severe COVID symptoms? Yeah, I can't, I mean, we have that. I don't remember the numbers offhand, but it's fairly substantial. Um, the question that we would have is, is that sustained? So let's say you mm -hmm. get your COVID and recover, and yes, there's kind of long COVID, but how do you go, is it just kind of the acute effect of the COVID infection, or do you have long-term consequences that, again, we can pick up as a function of your epigenetic agent? My guess would be yes, because people are experiencing kind of repercussions of COVID, you know, the, for the long haul sim, uh, symptoms that I think hopefully once the data is available, we can start, start actually measuring that. Yeah, that actually reminds me of a more general question then. Say I'm getting uh, my age tested when I'm not feeling so well, so I just have a mild fever or flu or something like that. Um, would my age be accelerated uh, in the data, but then I could go back to baseline maybe a few weeks later when I recover? So is there a way of parsing that out as well? Yeah, so I think this is why at least I, I believe, I'm, I'm not sure on this, why most of the companies that are selling at home um, or tests for epigenetic age say, make sure you don't have a cold and you're taking this when you're healthy because obviously any acute infection is gonna change your kind of immune cell profile. And that this can actually be a big read in for a lot of the epigenetic clocks. Um, I think too, because you know they, they are to some degree picking up things like systemic inflammation. And so if you have an acute inflammatory um, kind of response, it might mistake that for you have kind of this systemic inflammation and you, you would appear to have an older epigenetic age. Um, that being said, I don't see for people who are feeling well, at least from personal experience, I, I actually for a while was taking the test every month just as kind of a end of one experiment, not necessarily I was doing anything. I just wanted to make sure it was stable. I wasn't trying to change my lifestyle. Um, and I got almost exactly the same answer every time. So I think as long as you're feeling fairly normal, it, it shouldn't be, we would hope that it wouldn't be wildly fluctuating. I see. Okay. And what about the flip side of that? Say um, I suddenly start exercising more and eating healthy, and then I take the test. Uh, and would it sh show a lower epigenetic age maybe? And then I go back to my unhealthy habits. <laughs> Uh, what do you think would the clock would say there? Um, my guess is it would show, uh, especially depending on kind of what you were doing prior to do, doing this, like if you were already fairly healthy and then you kind of up 
affect your exercise a little. It might not be as responsive, but definitely someone who is fairly sedentary or has, you know, maybe not as healthy behaviors all of a sudden has a month where they're going to do. But, but I actually think that would be a motivating thing, at least for me personally, right? You see, wow, I got a big drop. And if I don't sustain it, I'm going to go back up. Um, so, so I think we don't know the long-term effects of some of these behavioral changes, but I think, you know, at least if you're sustaining them, I think, I think of that as more a real biological readout than something that's just this acute kind of spurious. Absolutely. Uh, and one of the reasons I ask you this is because I, I think a few months ago I asked you on Twitter, there was this um, eight week study done, which I think a lot of people cite where um, I, I think it was like 60 year old men or something, a group of healthy men, uh, they were made to eat plant-based food, cleaner food, exercise regularly, meditate, and it showed a drop in their epigenetic age by 3.23 years. Um, and I believe you mentioned there was some data that came out later that there wasn't that wasn't entirely accurate. Um, I guess what was not accurate about that? Uh, so actually, we haven't published this yet. We are hopefully get around to it. Um, so the data isn't out um, to show that, uh, but we went back and reanalyzed. Luckily, this team made their data public, which I think is fabulous, and they should be commended for that. Um, so we actually downloaded the data and reanalyzed them with these new clocks that I talked about, which get rid of the technical noise. And we were able to show that actually almost the entire effect that they observed was just this technical um, hmm. noise or variation. And it actually seemed like it was not that the um, people on the diet seemed to get um, younger, but actually the technical noise was in the placebo group where it just made them look really old at the second follow-up time. And so it looked like there was this big difference. Um, but when you reanalyze them, uh, that the, the effect unfortunately went away, which, which I was not, I, I, was, I thought it was an unfortunate thing to see because I think, you know, diet and exercise are powerful, probably some of the most powerful interventions we currently have for aging. So, but my guess is it would just need to be sustained for perhaps longer. Um, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. That's what I tell people. I said, I mean, so far, the best interventions we have are probably exercise and diet. So just go exercise. Yeah. I mean, I promise yeah. you'll make you feel better. <laughs> yeah, I, I joke that if like, the effects of exercise were like put into a pill, this would be like groundbreaking. Like, wow, we've completely slowed the, the onset of dementia and all these other things. And it's like, we have those tools at our disposal right now. Exactly, yeah. So speaking of that, have you tested any interventions with the systems age clock, maybe lifestyle interventions or maybe other ones that have work in mice, such as say rapamycin? Uh, we haven't with the systems age clock yet. Um, one thing that, that again, is totally tangential to that, those clocks that we're really working on are developing really good in vitro clocks, so clocks that can be applied to cell culture. And actually through those, you can do really high through the screens to figure out what might impact the clock. But the important thing there is we want measures that not only can track what we think of as like this artificial aging in vitro, but when you use those same measures in blood or in some other tissue that it tracks with age in vivo and is predictive of mortality or things like that. So we actually, to make sure they're actually measuring something we care about measuring because you know, you can change methylation, but whether that will change, like increase your life expectancy or delay disease, I think will be critical. But, and for those though, I will say, we are seeing an effect from rapamycin, but again, I think it needs to be played out a little bit more to make sure that it's actually going to have a beneficial effect mm -hmm. um, in, in a human, which I think yeah. there's some of it will, and there's definitely people who, who think it will. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I was talking to uh, Matt Kibble in last time, and he's, yeah. he's definitely very excited about rapamycin, which got me pretty excited too. Yeah. Uh, to no, say. Yes. Um, so. I hope, I hope it plays out. Yeah, no, I, I agree too. Um, so I guess some of your work around epigenetic reprogramming, um, I'm curious just you, cause you, you published a paper with a um, few other people in the field 
uh, what was your work around that and how, did, how does it relate to uh, some of the cloud work as well? Yeah, so we're very interested in, in reprogramming. Um, I know some people are really interested in it from a kind of a therapeutic perspective. I, I'm very interested in it just from a fundamental basic biology perspective. I mean, I think the discovery by Yamanaka that you can take a even an old somatic cell and basically convert it back to an embryonic state is amazing in and of itself, regardless of ever, if it ever even has any translational application. Um, and we're really interested in it because it seems to be that it's acting through remodeling the epigenome, which we can very clearly pick up using things like the clocks. So you can see that upon reprogramming, you see a drop in the epigenome clock, not, not for all clocks, but the majority of clocks um, that, that we apply. And you know you can even see it, we have looked at some data where you have the time course between you know, this, the somatic cell and you have maybe every few days showing the change in epigenetic age as a function of this reprogramming. And to me, the really exciting part is prior to these cells de-differentiating or turning back into kind of a pluripotent stem cell, when they're still maintaining their identity, they're actually seem to be rejuvenating. So they lose kind of the aging kind of changes first um, before converting into a, a stem cell. So that, that's really exciting that you can actually wipe some of these aging changes. And it's not because you're just taking a fully differentiated cell and making it um, pluripotent again. Um, so we are doing tons of experiments um, into reprogramming and trying to link it to the epigenetic aging that we see. So what changes change with age and what are responsive to reprogramming and why, why are they remodeled and reprogramming and what does this mean? And are there different factors that might act on different ones and you know all these different things. Um, so yeah, I have about four people <laughs> who are working on reprogramming um, right now. That's super exciting. So uh, I guess, um... Have you seen that effect in maybe most of the systems in the body? And also how much is the, the effect of aging wiped out? Like how, how many years can you go back in the clock? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the whole clock, you can, you can effectively, if you do the entire reprogramming scheme, like all the way back to a uh, IPSC cell, you basically reverse it to zero. So it, it truly does have the epigenetic age of an embryonic cell. Um, and that seems to be kind of regardless of the original age of the person or animal that you got the cell from, and to some extent, regardless of the cell type, although it hasn't been applied across that many different types of cells. So that's still to be determined. Um, but what we've more recently noticed is if you look at the clocks, it's not that every CPG is converted back to the young kind of profile but there seems to be a group of them that are really dominating the signal. And when you look at the clock, those are, it's actually those that are contributing to this kind of resetting signal, but you're not changing them all. Some of them stay quote aged. Um, and so what we're trying to do right now is understand which are the ones that are responsive versus not. And what do those kind of, what is it about those what are they capturing? Are those ones we care about in terms of predicting health? Because if, if they're not, then that's not very useful. If, you know, the ones that matter for mortality are the ones that are left and the other ones are reprogrammed, then <laughs> it's not helpful. It's, I will say as a, a teaser, it does seem to be the reprogrammed ones are very important for mortality prediction. So that was a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot to uncover about what what this entire thing is or how the cell is even able to do this. So that's what I was going to ask you. The dominant CPGs that you're noticing are um, the ones that are driving the age all the way back to zero. Um, have you noticed anything about whether those are the CPGs uh, that are aging fastest when, or not aging either way, uh, when you apply the system to each clock? Yeah, so I actually, again, I haven't, I, we haven't looked at them in the systems age because these kind of two projects are kind of going in parallel. And yes, at some point, I think we should kind of look at the 
look at how they relate to each other. We haven't done that yet. So we've looked at them in relationship to the published clocks. Um, and I can say, I can take, for instance, the Grim Age clock, which is a really strong predictor of mortality, or even the Fino Age clock, and say, what if I only looked at the part of the Grim Age clock captured by these CPGs? Um, and those are definitely ones that are changing with age, and they're definitely important for mortality. But there are other ones, too, that are important for mortality, so they're not basically the, the entire mortality prediction isn't captured by them, but they're, uh, they do seem to be a key component. I see, yeah. okay. So, so the CPGs that overlap maybe with the Grimmer H clock, you're saying could be, you're looking into whether they could be um, the, the dominant CPGs when it comes to uh, epigenetic reprogramming. Yeah, so, so I can um, take the, so basically when we looked at which CPGs are responsible to reprogram, we started with the clock CPGs. So I can say, you know, these few hundred are the ones that are really responsive to reprogramming. And then I'll go to the Grimage and say, uh, you know, which of the Grimage ones are in that group? And I'm just looking at the mortality prediction from the ones that are kind of due to the Venn diagram, all the Grimage clock CBGs, all the important ones, just looking at that overlap and that's important for mortality. Okay, I see, very cool. Uh, what what are you uh, what I guess what else are you excited about in the field of clocks? Uh, questions that you're super excited that your 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 lab is exploring, other labs are exploring. Um, so probably two things. So one is uh, single cell approaches. So I know there's a few labs. So Vadim Gladyshev's lab has worked a little bit on single cell approaches. We're really interested in doing single cell, not because I think they're going to be good biomarkers. I actually think single cell is not the right approach for a biomarker because it's exorbitantly expensive. And so, you, you know, if I can get almost as good a prediction from bulk as I can for single cell, it doesn't make sense to multiply your cost by, you know, a thousand <laughs> or something like that. Um, we are interested in it just from understanding how individuals' cells age. Because um, right now for the clocks, it's not clear whether the changes are happening in an individual cell. So whether this cell is gaining methylation or losing methylation at a given site with age, or whether cells that have methylation at that site are just taking over with age. So those are kind of, if that makes sense, two different things. And the clocks mm -hmm. would, the bulk clocks would treat them the same. They would not distinct, be able to distinguish those two things. Um, and it's only at the single cell can I say, the cells themselves are aging versus aging just selects for different types of cells. Um, and I think that'll be really important when we start thinking about interventions um, or even reprogramming is reprogramming, do all the set or do the majority of cells who end up expressing the, the Yamanaka factors actually move backwards in time essentially, or does it just give a selective advantage to ones that have a give, given profile and all of a sudden they they are able to move back and take over the whole kind of cell nature population or whatever. So that, that's kind of one thing <laughs> um, that we're really interested in. And then the other is um, kind of parabiosis, which I think of as similar to reprogramming. Um, we're not interested in parabiosis as in and of itself, like actually connecting uh, circulatory systems, but how do circulating factors we, we actually think the ones that are accumulating with age drive aging in cells. So how is it the cells are responding or why are they responding to circulating aging factors? And what is it about those factors that's, that's causing aging in the cells? And if you remove those, what, how do the cells kind of respond and kind of are able to kind of rejuvenate in some manner? And it sounds like the two could also be connected where if you figure out that maybe there are certain types of cells that are aging faster and then um, yep. that it, it's a, affected by, by certain factors that you find through parabiosis. I think that yep. could be quite, quite uh, telling in some ways. Yeah, I think all of this kind of has some, it, it's, all, it's all connected somehow. We have to just figure out exactly to what degree and in what ways. That's awesome. Um, on the, the, the other side of it, what are some of the challenges or uh, uh, limitations of the clocks? I and mean, we've discussed some of the limitations currently that your lab is uh, obviously working on, but what are some of the challenges you see that uh, with, with this field? 
Yeah, I think the for me, the main things I see that are an issue with the clock is that people just take them to some degree at face value. So this this tends to happen more with intervention testing where you see a reversal of the epigenetic clock and you we just assume that that's age reversal. And I think we have not proven that you've actually reversed the age because we we've even seen you can give someone glucocorticoids and that will reverse their age or, or kind of the stuff we talked about like momentarily but the, i doubt that they had any appreciable benefit in terms of expectancy. so i think you know in thinking about how the the field needs to continue and evolve i think we need to be able to link changes in in the clock sites to changes in life expectancy or in, increases in life expectancy or decreases in disease risk and i think we haven't done that yet. And I think people have gotten a little bit too ahead of the field in terms of just applying these clocks across the board and, and not questioning whether what, what they're actually observing is a valid measure of what they're hoping to get. Um, so that's one thing. I think the other uh, thing is that not all the clocks are the same, yet we talk about epigenetic clocks as a single entity. So we just say, epigenetic age was reversed. But I, I would say, and we've shown that it will completely depend on which clock you use. And we don't understand why that is yet. Um, and that's something we're really interested in is why do certain clocks work better in certain contexts and others work better in other contexts. And I would say to anyone using the clocks, probably use more than one just to make sure you're not getting kind of this, you know, random kind of type one error or something like this, and you actually, if you can see associations or changes across a large swath of the clocks, then I think we're a little bit uh, better off. Um, so those would be the, the two main things in terms of how clocks are applied, but then probably for me, the third thing is just how black box the clocks still are, which I think is something we need to put more energy towards. I think there's been so much momentum to generate these clocks and build these clocks and apply them. And I think at some point we need to kind of hit the brakes and actually say, okay, what is it that we're measuring? Why do these changes occur? Can we link them to other biological changes that we see with aging or, or something about kind of changes in chromatin with aging or, or anything, or, or again, changes in cell states. Is it senescence? Is it, you know, what is it about the aging process that produces this thing that seems so universal in that it happens across tissues. Now we've, from Steve Horvath's work, it happens across mammals. Um, I, I think the fundamental question is, okay, what is it then? Yeah, I'd be super curious to know, which is why I'm, I'm very excited that your lab is working on this and trying to figure out why it's actually happening, what's going on. I, and I, we can figure it out because I really want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm optimistic for sure. Um, so I guess you said something about that consumers, they shouldn't take these at face value. Uh, do you think if a consumer out there wants to go test their age, do you think there are good ones, uh, clocks out there that are reliable or maybe we should wait for system days to become a consumer product? Uh, well, it, so it is becoming a consumer product. I can say that. Um, I, I will say, I don't think it's that problematic for people who are applying this basically to just kind of get another indicator of their health. I don't think they're any less reliable than say getting your blood pressure taken or doing a, doing your heart rate on your Apple watch. Um, I think, you know, my worry was more when people are trying to find novel inter interventions mm -hmm. as using the clocks. But I think, you know, for tracking your overall wellness and health, I think for the most part, there's not, I don't think a lot of harm that can be done by, by using these. A track and actually, I think they're good motivators for people. And I think on average, they will reflect lifestyle um, kind of factors. Uh, I, I, it's when people start doing kind of more invasive things that I think you, you can really move the clock around without me, you know, without it actually mattering. <laughs> um, so in terms of the consumer ones that are reliable, I can, I can only speak for the ones I've been involved with developing because I actually, most of the consumer-based clocks are not published. So I have no way to 
say whether they're reliable or not reliable. I know a lot of, a few um, companies use just the original hand tissue clock and mm -hmm. which, which is an amazing clock for certain applications. I will say for tracking individual health in blood, using blood or saliva samples, that is not the right application for that clock because um, not just we, but you know, even Steve Horvath's group has shown it's not a good predictor of health when assessed in blood compared to other clocks. Um, or anyone using kind of the original applications are gonna have issues with this technical noise thing that I brought up at the beginning of our discussion where you know you could measure your epigenetic age in the same day and get a five or nine year difference. Um, but I will say the one um, that I helped develop that is at Elysium Health, and I can say I actually don't, I'm not working with Elysium Health anymore. Not, there's no, nothing negative. I just, it's circumstantial. Um, so I don't get, I'm not getting anything from saying <laughs> this, but um, uh, I can say that one is highly reliable. So we use this method that I said we developed to make sure that there's very minimal technical noise in it. Um, we have shown it's predictive of, morbidity and mortality, but that's all I can truly say for it. I can't say at an N of one level, it'll accurately assess how much life expectancy you have. I think that, you know, that goes beyond the science, but I think they're generally good tools to get another indicator of your overall health, assuming you're using one with low technical noise and that in a large population is shown to be predictive of things we care about besides age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I got Elysium uh, tested a, a few months ago as well. And uh, when people ask me this, what I said, I was like, well, I know Dr. Morgan Levine is working with them. So I, I can sort of trust that it'll be a little more reliable than the others. But uh, that's, that's definitely. Oh, yeah. They'll also be the ones that I'll put out the system ages. So they've licensed the system ages from Yale and we'll put them out as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sure, and that's a yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you can definitely test that and see uh, how good they are. Um, and when, when you talk about them being good uh, motivators, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, my rate of aging was slower, but uh, my partners was even slower than mine. And I got kind of competitive about it. I'm like, what? what? I'm going to step yeah, off my <laughs> yeah. yeah, you always want to get, yeah, I, I find it to be a very good motivator, especially if I'm like, okay, I'm going to test next week. I can't, you know, eat Halloween candy or whatever. <laughs> she wants, I guess. Yeah, no, amazing. So you also have a book coming out, uh, which is more on epigenetic health, I guess. So can we get a preview, sneak peek of it? Yeah, so it's coming out. I think the release date officially is May 3rd of next year. So it's still a while. I, I, I never knew before writing a book how long these things actually take. <laughs> I finished writing it last March. Um, uh, but yeah, it's basically, it's called True Age, and it's essentially on, it's not, it's not focused solely on epigenetic age, but it's on biological age, what is it, and, and talking about all the different ways we can measure it. So, you know, I do definitely talk about epigenetic clocks in there, but I also talk about, you know, other kind of physiological measures for doing it, or even if people want to do a kind of at-home DIY personal assessment using functional kind of measures. So, I, I mean, I think it's important to recognize that not all of us have the same resources and the epigenetic tests are very expensive. So are there other ways that people can do this, you know, cheaper that, you know, maybe in the future they, they could do it um, using the clocks that we can bring the, the price down. Um, and then I also talk just empirically what actually has been shown focusing on health behaviors for not, not necessarily focusing on kind of pharmacological or other interventions. But I think, again, kind of what we've discussed in the very beginning, the right now, the best bet for, for changing your aging is through some of these health behaviors. So how can you use biological age tracking to figure out the best behaviors for you? What do we know for people on average in the population? Um, and then I do have one chapter at the end about kind of more new age interventions and the promise, but I, I, I don't want to say that any of them are going to work before, before they're proven out. And I don't, I don't think there's a single intervention that's really proven, like a pharmacological one. I would say exercise is the only proven intervention mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. delaying aging. I, I, I can't wait for the book. I'm very excited for it. Um, on the point of lifestyle interventions, um, I'm curious, have you noticed whether 
there are certain ones that have a bigger impact than the other. Um, and say caloric restriction has more of an impact than exercise or fasting or just eating a plant-based or cleaner diet uh, with on your epigenetic age? Um, so, so I actually don't think we know this. And I think this is part of why these measures should be incorporated a little bit more. So I think, you know, it's very hard epidemiologically to study behaviors because they tend to be correlated with each other. People who exercise also eat better. And it, it's hard to run kind of a randomized control trial for some of these things. But I do think, hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to figure out and what, what, is, what gives you kind of a bigger bang for your buck. But I would argue that it might also be different for every individual. So mm -hmm. the diet that I'm going to benefit the most from might be slightly different than someone else. And I think too, this goes back to conversations about caloric restriction is what I, you know, a lot of people bring up the paper where they have different mouse strains on caloric restriction and some of them benefit and some of them don't. And I think the issue is that they have a set amount of restrict, like a degree of how much restriction all the mice are getting, but actually how much a specific strain can tolerate might be different from another. And actually, mm -hmm. figure, and actually some of them might, even the ones that show deleterious effects could benefit from caloric restriction. They just need a different kind of not level. amount of level of caloric restriction. And I think only through having these more immediate biomarkers, once we feel like they're very reliable and valid, can we actually start fine tuning based on my genetic profile, what might be the best kind of do, do I benefit from fasting? I, you know, I don't know. I practice intermittent fasting. I have no idea whether it's serving me any, any benefit. I don't think most people do. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good point. Um, on that point, do you think the clocks will be able to measure what the long-term effects would be? For example, if, if say we do establish biomarkers or we come up with an intervention uh, that we know for sure works in humans, but I mean, I, I want to know whether that's working right now versus 20 years later. So will the clocks be able to measure that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really hope that's the, the goal, right, is, you know, to, to measure both the long-term effects, predict where people are going to be in the future if they stay on the same path, right, if, it, if they don't change anything. But also, I think as more and more data gets incorporated, we can really harness AI to potentially predict if you were to adopt some lifestyle change or some change, how would that change your trajectory in the future? And, you know, the more data we have, the more people we observe, both their biomarkers and them undergoing different lifestyle interventions, we'll actually be able to predict that, you know, based on your profile, if you did this, you might end up more like this. So, so almost like how, how um, different music streaming apps will predict your, you know, I think you'll like this song because people like you enjoy this song. So it's, I think you will benefit from high intensity interval training because people with your profile tend to benefit this much from high interval, high intensity interval training or something like that. Absolutely, it'll make it so much easier to give personalized guidance then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one last question I have on the clocks. Um, you mentioned there are so many different clocks and people use the, the term, not almost a blanket way, just epigenetic clock, so and so. Uh, do you think we will converge on one or two clocks that work best? Or do you think it makes sense to have different clocks uh, such that we can measure different, uh, different things or different um, ages of organs in the body? So I, I actually lean towards the latter. I think it is better to have multiple clocks, but with the caveat that they're only useful if you know what makes them distinct from each other. So right now, all the clocks we have were developed with the same goal in mind. So they weren't actually developed in a distinct manner. They just happened to use different samples or maybe a slightly different outcome or a different population. Um, but I think if we can actually generate multiple clocks, because I don't think any one clock is going to be enough to capture kind of the multifactorial things that go wrong with aging. Um, but we, ne we need to know what makes them different from each other and what, what this clock means versus what that clock means. And I think then it'll be really beneficial. And this is, you know, even moving beyond 
using epigenetic clocks and DNA methylation. There's so many other kind of omics or biochemical measurements we can get that, you know, combining these, but only in a, in a kind of meaningful and um, informative way will these be important. But I, I would argue that even though we started talking about you have a chronological age and a biological age, we don't have a biological age. We have multiple, like hypothetically, every cell in your body has a different biological age and you're just a mosaic of your different biological ages. And how does that personal profile of different biological ages, what does that mean for your health or someone else's? And that kind of thing. Exactly. And which is also something we touched upon where at least with systems age, you're trying to figure out different personal profiles, whether your kidney is accelerating at a faster rate than your liver or yeah. some other organ. Yeah. Um, maybe shifting gears away from epigenetic clocks a little bit, your lab also works on um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think one thing I heard you say was that uh, you're looking into, say, 60% of the people who do have the APO4 gene versus, uh, and end up getting Alzheimer's versus 40% who don't and are resilient. Uh, what is that 40% doing that maybe makes them resilient? You're, you're trying to look into that. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious if you found anything on that. I'm, and I'm also asking selfishly because I do actually have an APO4 gene. So. <laughs> um, so, so a little bit of backstory. Um, I actually became interested in this topic because I found out someone in my family was had uh, was a heterozygous E4. Um, then I, I quickly tested mine and ended up not being. But it was the whole reason why I started to think like, oh, can we understand how someone would be resilient despite having a genetic predisposition? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer yet. Um, we have a lot of data. So we have most of the data we're looking at is actually from uh, post-mortem brain samples where we have a few hundred samples and we have different omics measures measured in different parts of the brain. Um, and we're really trying to combine that to understand. We've, most of our samples are APOE4 positive, either homozygous or heterozygous. Um, and we have some hypotheses about what might um, differentiate the one, people who do get Alzheimer's versus not, but uh, nothing um, conclusive enough for me <laughs> to say yet. But hopefully, um, hopefully in the next year, we'll have a little bit more <laughs> to kind of say about that. And I mean, I do think it's something we, we should be able to uncover to some degree. And, and people with e should be able to do something to still minimize their risk as much as possible. Well, I'll definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, okay, exercise right now again. To go, not that we're not looking at our data, but still, if I'm, out of mm -hmm. all of it. Yeah. Um, is there any other work you're doing around Alzheimer's disease? Because I know you, you focus on this as well. Uh, so I think the only other thing that we're really doing with Alzheimer's disease is some kind of in vitro studies. So we're working with brain cells in vitro and trying to understand how the presence of things like um, amyloid beta, so ABO, would actually induce cellular changes. Um, so studying that, whether you can actually induce senescence through the presence of some of the um, neuropathological um, factors in Alzheimer's disease, but, uh, and, and then doing some kind of single cell work on aging in brain cells and, and trying to then bring that to the single cell work done in actual brains to see if we can kind of see any shared phenomenological aging changes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned senescence and I've heard you talk about just uh, your lab maybe measuring senescence in the brain and also maybe some of the relationship between um, senescence and the epigenetic clocks. Can you speak to some of your work around that? Yeah, I, I will say that it does not seem for the most part that the epigenetic clocks are picking up cellular senescence. Um, they might, it, it could be the case that changes that are captured by epigenetic clocks might, pre, might predispose a cell to undergo senescence, but I, I don't think what we're picking up is senescence itself. Um, that being said, I, there does seem to be evidence that, I, and, and it would make sense, that senescence is encoded at the level of the epigenetic, at the epigenome as well. Um, I just don't think the clocks are picking that up, but 
we hypothetically will be able to pick that up using the cell culture models. Um, I don't think they're picked up because if you think about um, a blood sample or a tissue sample, so such a small proportion of your cells are actually senescent. And because we're doing this at bulk, which is kind of a cell average, I think just those signals don't end up coming through. But if we can induce senescence in culture and capture the, the epigenetic changes associated with that, then I think we can start developing potentially better senescence biomarkers. Um, but yeah, I think senescence is another thing, kind of like epigenetic clocks where we use this blanket term, but it's actually senescent cells aren't one thing. And it, it's really hard to, besides the, the kind of uh, growth arrest and to some degree SASP, although that might also vary by the, the type of senescent cell, there aren't, there's not that much we can say about defining characteristics of a senescent cell. So, so yeah. could there be a case, and I'm probably going to use it in a blanket way right now, but could there be a case where, um, we all do. <laughs> where you have a high volume, a high degree of senescent cells, um, but the, you said the clocks aren't really picking that up. So the clocks would still say you have, say, a lower biological age, but then uh, the senescence biomarker is, is giving a different indication then. Yeah, it's possible. I, I would think that people who have high senescence burden have other accelerated aging phenotypes in those tissues um, mm -hmm. that would be picked up by the clocks, but we're not picking up in the clock senescence itself. And actually, uh, interestingly, what we find is if you immortalize a cell, so it won't undergo senescence, just keeps um, replicating, that actually seems to accelerate the clocks more than inducing senescence through a non-replicative um, pathway. So I'm not entirely sure what to make of that, but it is, the clocks are definitely, as they are constructed now, not senescence clocks are not good biomarkers of senescence. Mm -hmm. That's very so, yeah, interesting. Could hypothetically have high senescence burden to some degree that would not get picked up by an epigenetic clock. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right, uh, one of my last questions then. How much of this is uh, your genetics are heritable? How much of epigenetics oh. is? Yeah, yeah, okay. just your biological age that's captured by the clocks. Um, so depends how you kind of estimate this. So people have used um, kind of these GWAS studies to try and estimate this. So we call this like SNP-based heritability estimates. And it seems to be on par with what people think is heritable in terms of lifespan. So it seems about like 10, maybe 20%. Some estimates have said 30, although most of them have said kind of 10 to 20 recently. Uh, the difference between your, your epigenetic age and your chronological age is heritable. Um, one caveat is that it probably depends the age at which you're measuring that um, because mm -hmm. people actually diverge more over time, probably not due to genetic factors. And I think even in twins, there's been some good data showing that they have more similar epigenetic profiles when they're young. And actually over time, just through behaviors or random things or other environmental things, they, they end up diverging a little. So I would say probably when you're young, a higher proportion, but by the time we're talking about when most of the diseases of aging manifest, it's probably very little. I see, okay. Yeah, I've, I've heard you talk about that before. So I guess when you're in your 20s, 30s, maybe a higher proportion, but then after that, a lot of it seems to be epigenetic yeah. factors. Yeah, you can change, you can change it a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can intervene in your aging a lot more over time. Yeah, yeah, that's very exciting. Um, I guess anything, any last thoughts on just clocks in general of the aging field that maybe we haven't covered? Um, I think that's most of, yeah, what, what I would think we should talk about those yeah, I think we covered everything and it was a really great conversation. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. I learned uh, so much about these clocks and I'm, I'm super excited to keep finding out uh, just answers to some of the questions that your lab is working on and other labs are working on as well. Thank you so much, yeah. Awesome, thanks so much for your time today, Morgan. I appreciate it. Yep. Hi again, everyone. 
If you enjoyed today's episode and want to be notified of upcoming podcast releases, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, which is livelongerworld.com. You can also subscribe to my channel, Live Longer World, on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you find your podcast. And make sure to turn on the notifications and the bell icon. If you're finding my work useful, you can also support me by donating on patreon.com forward slash live longer world. Your support helps me add additional features like transcripts and also create valuable content. Additionally, your support comes with benefits such as a monthly curated email on longevity science research and health optimization tips. You can check out all the benefits on my Patreon page. Lastly, you can also help spread the word by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And you can leave up to a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, I have social media, so if you wish to follow me on Twitter, I am at Live Longer World and Instagram at Longevity Future. Thanks for listening, and that's it for now. I'll catch you next time.